let me know when it's a very good morning to everyone um welcome to the uh second um in a series of webinars um from recoup looking at plastic recycling and resources the new reality i'm steve morgan the policy infrastructure manager at recoup and um, I'm very pleased to welcome a whole host of excellent uh, speakers today and our, and our chair. Today's focus is on the massive opportunities and also the challenges within films and flexible plastics. Next slide, please, Max. And next one, we'll move on to the next one. Um, so we've already had um, a number, one webinar already on rigid plastics. Um, there are four others planned as you can see on the slide. So all you're going to do is go to our website and to, to register your interest to attend those. Um, just some housekeeping to go through. Just to clarify, only our speakers and the chair of today's session have access to their web camera and microphone. The slides are controlled by Recoup. And if you could use the Q&A function for your questions, it needs to be used by the chair for panel questions. Um, Panel questions. The slides are controlled. Yeah, so please do not use the chat function or raise your hand as we're monitoring these. Can I also ask that the speakers are not speaking to mute their microphones whilst others are also speaking? Any questions we will not be able to cover and we will collate and prepare a recoup document to send out to all the delegates so they will receive this. They will also receive uh, a recording of the webinar as well and the slides. Next, next slide, please. So just a few words about Recoup. Um, we're a member-based charity um, that was set up around about 30 years ago now, um, and we cover their whole plastics value chain. So our members are made up of local authorities, waste management companies, uh, brands, retailers, recyclers, um, and anyone within that, that spectrum. Um, our ambition is to, is to lead and develop plastic recycling. Um, sustainable development of plastic recycling and the circular economy. So we coordinate, we inform, um, we educate, and our, our activities are wide ranging. If you want to find out more about Recoup, just go to go to our website. Next slide, next. Um, so just a little bit to give you a flavour about what we do. Um, we've actually got a whole host of uh, publications. So. Um, these include our annual plastics collection survey, which track plastics collections. We've got another report um, that looks at the sorting and processing capacities for the UK to, to meet our ongoing targets. Um, there's information around um, deposit return schemes. We've done recently done a, a COVID-19 impact report. Um, we respond to consultations, the most recent one being the, the plastic packaging tax we uh, responded to alongside InkPen. We've got uh, plastic um, pack design guidance, um, recyclability by design, a suite of, um, of documents around that, and also the certification around it as well. So Recyclas and OPRL, and how the, the, the pack credentials actually stack up um, to be recycled. Our consumer facing brand is Pledge to Recycle Plastics. Um, and recently you might have seen a Stop It, Don't Drop It campaign, which we are promoting. Um, which has been very, very well received. But we couldn't do this without obviously our valued, valued members. Next slide, thanks, please. So just a, a bit of information about um, plastic films and flexibles from a recoup point of view. Um, this is nothing new, uh, developing these opportunities. And if you go back to nearly 20 years ago, there was actually a fact sheet that Recoup produced of how to recycle plastic film. Although it was mainly commercial film, actually it spoke about quality levels, collection points, end markets, um, handling, waste management side of things. So it was all in there, but there was no real drive and political pressure uh, or ambition at the time to do anything with it. Um, now it's different. Um, we've actually been tracking plastic film collection uh, levels in our household collection survey um, and last year we found that actually year on year local authority service provision was reducing. There's actually around about 20,000 tonnes of it currently collected um, for the few local authorities that do collect it um, and this translates to a 5% collection rate. 
So of the 400,000 or so tons that are placed in the market, only 5% is collected for recycling. So we're actually more recently, we've been looking at front of store collection um, schemes and the opportunities around that. So uh, we've been working very closely with M&S and um, co-op, um, looking at development of their schemes and also doing some material composition analysis um, of that material that's collected. And that gives us every single piece of encouragement that front of store collection schemes can work. Um, so that's it from, uh, from a recoup point of view at the moment. So just a big thank you again to, to Carol and the other speakers that have dedicated their time and for everyone else for, for dialing in today. And it's my pleasure to hand over to, uh, to Carol uh, to get into the presentations and debate. Okay, thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you to Recoup for inviting me to chair this webinar this morning. As uh, it's been said, it's the opportunities and challenges within films and flexible plastics. Uh, my name is Carol Taylor, and I'm the chair of the Local Authority Recycling Advisory Committee, or LARAC, and I'll be chairing this morning. Um, we're all crossing our fingers that the technology behaves itself. This is yet another new piece of software that I've not used before. It's the Zoom webinar software. So and another tick in the box for the list, <laughs> which gets longer every week. Um, I'm sure you've all exper had experience of when the technology doesn't work, so please bear with us if anything goes wrong, and maybe suggest if you're having problems, just leave the webinar and come back in again, see if that fixes it. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us this morning, and we have four excellent speakers giving us their opinion on all things flexible plastic related. Each speaker will give a presentation of 15 minutes, so I will be uh, doing my best to keep us to time. And then we'll have a question and answer session at the end, but if we have time in between um, speaker slots, we may have ask some there and then. So in order to answer a question, use the question and answers function on Zoom. Um, we can see the questions, um, but all the participants can't. So you, you probably can see your own, but you can't see what everybody else is asking. So I will, I will sort of moderate that and control what questions are actually asked. You can do that as speakers are presenting. So there's no need to wait to the end or anything like that. Just do it as and when you feel something pops into your head. Uh, finally, just to say, as Steve said, a copy of the webinar and the slides will be sent to all the attendees after the webinar. And if we don't manage to cover all the questions, they'll also be put to the speakers and the answers will be sent out as well. So I was asked to do a bit of scene setting. So I think uh, Steve just sort of touched on it. Um, you know, years ago, back in the 90s, when I started out as a recycling officer, we didn't have much plastic recycling collection. Um, but over the years, as plastic has become uh, more widely used in packaging, uh, we started to add firstly plastic bottles to recycling collections and then more recently um, pots, tubs and trays have been added. And now we're discussing how to recycle more flexible plastics and films. Um, as Steve mentioned, you know, it, it was around the, in the, the 90s but just wasn't very widespread and now we're looking at how we take that next step. We know that our aim and that of the governments is to recycle more and introduce a set of co a consistent core materials for recycling. That was the subject of the waste strategy consultations last year and will be contemplated in the next round of strategy consultations planned for early next year. From a, a local authority perspective, the challenges for us are in the collection, the sorting and the availability of our markets. We want to see materials that are easy to identify as recyclable to consumers. And by, by recyclable, we don't really want to see composite materials. So product design is very important in recyclability. Labelling, it will be a key issue too, and LARAC is a part owner of the Unpack Recycling, Recycling Label, OPRL, and their research shows that 80% of consumers look to the packaging label for help on how to recycle. Therefore, we'd like to see all other labels removed apart from the OPRL label to avoid any confusion. We also need adequate sorting facilities to be able to sort out the different plastic polymers if, if they're collected along with other plastics and or other packaging. And finally, we need stable end markets for the material we collect, giving us the assurance that the offtake and the prices remain viable. At the end of all this though, even if we get the right systems and the markets in place, we still need people to put the right thing in the right bin. Contamination of recycling is a major issue for local authorities. And so we need consumers, members of the public, to take responsibility and ownership for doing the right thing too. I'm hoping therefore that today's speakers will be able to address some of these issues 
and give their view on the opportunities and challenges within films and flexible plastics, which just happens to be the title of this webinar. So firstly, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who's Alison Bramfit. She's Group Packaging Manager from Nestle UK in Ireland. And Alison will be talking about Nestle's approach to plastic films and flexibles. Thank you, Alison. Thanks, Carol. Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, as Carol's mentioned, I'm the Group Packaging Manager for Nestle UK in Ireland, um, responsible for packaging sustainability within the UK. Uh, and also represent um, the pack of fillers or brands in the ACP, so the Advisory Committee to Packaging to DEFRA. And it's my pleasure today to come and talk to you on the actions that Nestle is taking on flexible packaging. So a little bit about Nestle. Um, Nestle is now one of the world's largest food and beverage companies. We have more than 2,000 brands globally and are present in 190 countries. Move to the next slide. So back in April 2018, Nestle launched our global commitment to support our vision that none of our packaging, including plastics, ends up in landfill or litter. And our commitment is that 100% of our packaging is recyclable or reusable by 2025. To achieve this, we have a number of focus areas uh, and some of which I'll touch on more as I go through my presentation today. So increasing the use of recycled plastics within our packaging where possible. As a food and beverage company, it is a real challenge due to the regulation constraints that are in place and also the quality requirements that we need um, to ensure that the food uh, is still maintained and safe. Also looking to play an active role in the development of recycling infrastructure through engagement on the future uh, of the extended producer responsibility regulations and also supporting well-designed deposit return systems. Looking at how we label our packaging to inform consumers on how to dispose of the packaging in the right way is also going to be important and Carol's already touched on that. And looking at evaluation on new solutions to reduce the use of our plastics um, and look at reusable packaging solutions. Next slide. So these focus areas fit into three key pillars, which the portal will take this forward. I'll go through each pillar with just a few examples of what we're doing. So pillar one is focused on developing packaging for the future. And um, within this, we're looking at focusing on rethinking our packaging to ensure it's gonna meet our commitment and looking at opportunities to reduce the use of our virgin plastics, as I've already mentioned, and we'll talk more about the commitment on that um, later in the presentation. Looking at exploring new paper-based and compostable and biodegradable materials um, to ensure that we have the right materials going forward. In pillar two, we're looking and focusing on shaping waste-free future. So that, what does that mean to Nestle? That means that we're looking at how do we improve and, and play our part in terms of making that infrastructure fit for the future. And in Europe, we have the ambition that 90% of our PET bottles and caps will be collected by 2025. We're also looking at introducing reusable packaging and exploring new reusable delivery systems as part of that. And then, as I've already mentioned, it's key that brands also play a very key role in supporting the extended producer responsibility and future regis legislation, um, such as deposit return schemes as well across Europe to look at how we support increasing those recycling rates. Finally, pillar three, which is absolutely important to ensure we take our consumers along this journey and drive new behavior. Firstly, we've already eliminated all not easy to recycle single-use plastic items from all the Nestle facilities globally. We're looking at how we raise awareness for consumers, but also our employees on the on plastic waste issues that are around us. And looking at how we help consumers to dispose of the packaging in the right way through labeling and communications. Next slide, please. So as I've already said, our commitment is that 100% of our packaging will be recyclable or reusable by 2025. What does this mean? What do we mean by recycled and recyclable? And this is how citizens will judge us. They will judge us by what's actually recycled. And there is a clear difference about claiming something is recyclable um, and looking at what is actually recycled. 
And here we're looking at uh, the definition of recyclable uh, against the new plastics e e economy global commitment, where the definition is that 30% of the population and over 400 million people need to have the capability of being able to recycle that material. And as Carol already mentioned, the consumer is going to play a key role in this going forward. They need to actively place the packaging into the recycling stream for it to be recycled. So for something to be recycled, we need them to remember the important role that they play in enabling that to take place. Next slide, please. Moving to talk more specifically on flexibles, if we look at the infrastructure in place a day across Europe, there is a low amount of flexible plastics collected and recycled. With the only countries collecting and recycling at scale in place being Germany and the Netherlands. We have worked collaboratively uh, with Suez and other brands over the past 12 months, and we've looked at the volume of material in the UK, which suggests actually that there could be slightly more than currently is thought, but around 895,000 tonnes of plastic film placed in the market in the UK. That report and key findings uh, will be shared over the next few weeks. I'm sure you'll hear more from Suez in terms of that. With around 70 to 80 percent of that flexible plastics being polypropylene and polyethylene in the UK, there is a huge value in the material that's out there and we need to kind of consider how do we take that forward for recycling. But today we only have 15 percent of councils collecting the film and it has resulted in a small proportion of that film being collected for recycling today. However, there are a number of UK retailers such as M&S, Tesco's and Co-op who have started trials to look at how they can collect film and take that material back from consumers to, to, take, to get the value back out of the film. And those in-store collections are going to be vital to looking at how we support the development of this infrastructure as we look to transition in the future in time to collect that material from curbside. Nestle are very supportive of these different initiatives that are taking place and they're really uh, ready to play our part in the development of a, uh, the right collection and recycling required uh, in the UK for flexible plastics. Next slide please. In January 2020, Nestle announced our commitment to reduce the use of our virgin plastics by a third by 2025. It's also important to look at how we're going to support this. As I agree with Carol's point, we need to also drive the value of that material. So we will support this by investing more than 1.5 billion Swiss francs to pay a premium for food grade recycled plastics, such as PET, polypropylene, polyethylene. This should look to stimulate the industry and investors to build up recycling infrastructure, specifically in PET, but notably, we really need this for polypropylene and polyethylene for which the infrastructure is slightly lacking currently, especially for food grade. Without a market for the end products, there is no incentive for recyclers to invest in this infrastructure. And we recognize that and are willing to look at how we work together with those recyclers to enable this development. This is where we can link to the work that we're doing to move to simpler mono-material plastic packaging uh, within our flexible portfolio. We also just announced that the Packaging Sustainability Fund, which is a 250 million Swiss bank fund to invest in innovative companies and solutions, such as novel packaging and novel solutions to support reductions, reuse, but also recycling. This fund will also be used to boost the whole packaging waste and value chain and recycling infrastructure where we see lack of momentum. This is the way forward to make plastics circular and Importantly, acceptable again for the public and for Nestle. Next slide, please. So some of the live examples of what we're trying to do in the UK, specifically around flexible plastics. Firstly, against our first pillar on developing new packaging, we have launched clear guidelines globally called the Nestle Golden Rules. These rules will be followed by all packaging um, and have specific rules for the different types of packaging. But specifically, we have clear rules on plastic films and moving towards simpler structures. With this, we've also launched a negative list, which defines materials which should not be used, such as PVC and PVDC, 
and is quite aligned to that that we see communicated by the plastic pack today. We are moving away from complex laminates, as I've already mentioned, to look at simplification. Where we can, this isn't possible for all of the laminates, but where we can, we will look to move to monopolyethylene and polypropylene films. And we've already done this for KitKat across the full range. We're also rolling out paper-based packs, and Smartis is uh, one of those brands that will look to take this forward. We'll move the entire range of Smarties to paper by the end of Q1 2021. And these materials will then be able to be recyclable with curbside with paper. Finally, we're looking to increase the recycled content of shrink film, which today as a food manufacturer is our focus for, uh, for the recycled content for film. Um, but I'm looking at how we can increase that going forward. So today we're looking at rolling out a 50% recycled polyethylene content in our shrink film for coffee and for our water business. If you then look at how we're looking to support shaping a waste-free future, we're looking at really looking at collaboration in this area. Um, looking firstly at, C at CFLEX, um, where we're looking to develop a circular economy for plastic films across Europe and how we can support them in driving that forward such as the recent guidelines that have been issued in terms of what, to, uh, what materials should be used uh, for designing flexible packaging. Nestle are also founding signatories in the UK plastic packs, and I'm sure Helen will come on to talk more about what they're doing, where we supported the development of the flexible plastics roadmap, which I'm sure you'll hear more about. We we're also working closely with Recoup and as I've already mentioned, Suez and other industry bodies in exploring opportunities for collecting and recycling films in the UK. We we're also looking at what we can do today to drive new behaviour. And we've launched a TerraCycle collection and recycling programme for both confectionery and pet food plastic films across the UK, where we can start to communicate and talk to consumers about how they can recycle their film and start them on that journey to recycle the materials that, uh, that we have. And those platforms that we've created are open to all brands within those categories. We're also rolling out of the on-pack recycling label to all packs within Nestle and ensuring it's really clear for consumers in terms of what we're communicating they should be doing to that material, whether that is recycle or not to recycle. We're also communicating about recycling with advertisements and starting to look at how we can promote recycling through our brands. We've done this initially through Yes, which launched uh, in recent years, uh, and looking at how we encourage that new behaviour with the changes we're making to our packaging. Final slide, please. So, as I've said, we're always looking at collaborative opportunities to increase recycling infrastructure and recycling in the UK. Now that's broad across all the materials that, we're, uh, that we use, but really specifically focused on flexible plastics. And we'll have an exci more exciting news to share in this area and the actions we're taking in coming months. I'm uh, looking forward to being able to share more in terms of what we're doing in this space in that time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alison. Uh, yeah, some interesting uh, information there. I think, you know, what also on my opening talking about the recyclability of materials you, you talked a lot about there and I'm glad to hear that's um, an ambition of uh, Nestle's as well. I've got um, a few questions coming in and we have got a few, we are a few minutes ahead. So I'll just try and see if I can cover some that are directed to you. Um, there was one here that regarding the use of paper packaging, have life cycle assessment studies been done to see the amount of energy and water used for production of paper and if the raw material is sourced responsibly? Yeah, good questions. Um, so yes, um, absolutely. While our commitment is focused on the recyclability of our packaging, we are also very aware of the need to uh, in, in look at life cycle assessments uh, and Nestle has always been taken has always taken that approach for a long time and we have inbuilt systems within our processes to do life cycle assessments so absolutely these changes that we're making on our packaging we're also one looking at recyclability and engaging with industry to ensure that it's recyclable in the markets where we'd be placing that material and secondly looking at the life cycle assessment to ensure that it's the right thing for us to be doing so yes that's definitely been done um, 
And in terms of the second question on responsibly sourced, yes, all of Nestle's paper um, and fiber-based materials are all responsibly sourced. And we have our own specific Nestle responsibly sourced program that enables and supports that. Um, it's very detailed, um, but um, that is certainly something that Nestle is very focused on. And I, I won't go into more detail than that, but if anyone was like more information on what we do there, then please let me know. Okay, thank you. And maybe another one here. Um, many applications in food packaging require barrier materials and multi-layer materials to protect the food from spoilage. However, these materials are often interfering with the recyclability of these materials. What is Nestle's way forward to help the recycling industry with these issues? Yeah, it's uh, another good question. Um, so yes, some of our uh, some of the complex laminates do have a number of different uh, materials within them, and that's really to ensure. And we should never forget what that what that role that material is is playing, which is to protect the food and the product that's inside it, to ensure that we have no food waste for the desired time that the consumer needs to have that in within the packaging so it does play a very important role to reduce and stop food waste that's the first point secondly on recyclability absolutely it needs to play an important role on our commitment going forward and as i've already said part of our commitment and part of that change you'll see coming forward will be moving to simpler structures moving to monomaterials monopolyethylenes and monopolypropylenes uh, which is already the high, highly used in the UK um, and, has, uh, and is simpler, I guess, from a point of view of, of taking forward that recycling um, aspect. Now, there are solutions today that enable the more complex structures uh, to be recycled, and we're looking at how we can engage and support those other technologies that are available for the more complex structures Okay, thank you. We've got loads of questions coming in, uh, so I can't really cover them all right now, but we will come back to them at the end of the session as well. Um, so I'd like to move on now to our second speaker, who is uh, Helen Bird, Strategic Engagement Manager with RAP. Uh, very timely, you know, as, as now we're less than two weeks uh, to one of RAP's major national campaigns, which is uh, Recycle Week, starting the 21st of September. So over to you, Helen, and I think you said you wanted to answer the question about composite plastics as well. Oh, yeah. Yes, thank you, Carol. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I think I might have hit the wrong button in the chat. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> the question. I mean, I think the question was relating to, um, it, it's a, so effectively the multi-layer um, type, um, type packaging. I think that's what you were referring to, wasn't it, Carol? Yeah, yeah. lovely. Absolutely. So sorry, I shall not press anything in the chat just in case. <laughs> So can we go to the uh, to the first slide, please? Thank you. So so my theme of the presentation really is um, is let's get film done. Let's get film recycling um, taking off. Um, I am pretty confident that of the 220 people who are now joined as participants, the vast majority of you are going to be um, in the same camp as, as I'm pretty confident the rest of the speakers are that we really need to get moving on plastic film recycling. Um, next slide, please. So my role at RAP is I oversee the technical delivery of the UK Plastics Pact. Um, hopefully we're all aware of the Plastics Pact. Um, this is the vision for it. Um, it's not about demonizing plastic, but it is about valuing plastic and making sure that ultimately it doesn't pollute the environment. Next slide, please. So these are the targets of the Plastics Pact. It's about eliminating what's unnecessary and what's problematic and tackling those really big challenges, ensuring that 100% is um, reusable, um, compostable and of course recyclable, significantly increasing our recycling rate of this material from around 46% up to 70% in 2025 and achieving an average across the board of 30% recycled content. Next slide, please. So film for the UK Plastics Pact is the absolute number one um, priority. And next slide, please. And the reason for this is because we placing a lot of this stuff on the market represents about a quarter of all household plastic packaging. But as Steve mentioned earlier, a very, very small amount of it is actually recycled. Um, 
It's a very highly visible pollutant. It's easily blown into the waterways. Um, it's a very voluminous material, takes up a lot of space in people's waste bins, um, causes a lot of frustration. We've already collecting a lot of plastics. Um, local authorities have done a tremendous amount of work over the years. Um, we have really good consistency um, in, in a lot of the rigid plastics. This is where we really need to focus our efforts. And next slide, please. Um, and it's not just us in the industry who are thinking about this. So this, this is a screen grab here from, um, from a uh, data from our Recycle Now website, which is visited by millions of people every year come to our website looking for information on what to do with items. And you can see that plastic film is by far and away the biggest thing that people are searching for. It intrigues me, by the way, though, that plastic bottles is number two. Um, and it just emphasises that we can't be complacent when it comes to communications. We need to keep on driving the home that message. So thank you very much, Carol, for, um, for that plug about Recycle Week, which is coming up at the end of the month. So everyone can join in that campaign. Um, next slide, please. So with the backdrop of all of this rationale, um, we have under the UK Plastics Pact um, developed a roadmap for flexible packaging. Next slide. Um, and the, 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 the roadmap um, in the next slide um, will show you that there are five key areas um, for the roadmap. If you wouldn't mind just moving on the slide, that'd be great, thank you. So, um, so these five key areas are um, actually touch very much upon the points uh, which Alison, Aunt Carol and Steve have made this morning, um, which is in order to get the collections, it's not just about collections, we've got to make sure that the stuff actually does get recycled. We can't be talking about greenwash. So in order to achieve this, it's about simplified packaging design, thinking about front of store collection points as an interim solution before we get implementation of kept, um, curbside collection and collections from businesses as well, that household-like material. We're gonna need significant investment in sorting um, and reprocessing. And of course, we can't do any of this if we don't have end markets in place. There's no point in collecting the stuff if it doesn't get recycled. So next slide, please. So the roadmap, I'm not gonna go through all of these in detail. Um, you can take a look at the website and, and, and have a look at that for yourselves. But I think just touching on some of the key points that we draw out um, is that 80% of the, of the plastic film that's currently placed on the market for consumers, um, it's predominantly made up of polypropylene and polyethylene. Um, we have got to rationalise around these polymers. Um, and, but that's not to say that we don't require the functionality that multi-material um, uh, also um, delivers. But we do need to move away from those multi-materials as much as we possibly can in order to for, for the packaging to be mechanically recycled. Um, but of course, achieving recyclability, it's not just about design. You can achieve it through, um, through the, the, the treatment process as well. And at RAP, we do believe that chemical recycling or non-mechanical recycling, as we refer it to, Plays, is going to play a really important role. But these processes are not magic. You know, you can't just put anything in them and expect something really high quality to get out. They also um, do have constraints in their processes. So we need to look at what those constraints are and make sure that we're developing um, that multi-layer packaging so that it's also conducive to be chemically recycled. Um, next slide, please. So when it comes to collections, um, what we're really striving to achieve is for all plastic packaging to be collected for recycling. Um, we're only going to achieve significantly higher recycling rates if we collect it from people's houses and, of course, from um, places of work as well. But, um, you know, this is not going to happen overnight. Local authorities absolutely need the funding that's required in order to deliver those collection systems and all of the other things that need to be put in place as well. Um, and we've done a good lot, a, a lot of research um, and social listening and to, to, to consumers and what it is that they want and what they're prepared to do. And, um, and as Steve mentioned, actually people are interested in taking this material to supermarket collection points. It's great to see that the co-op um, 
launched their scheme for the acceptance of all plastic film um, yesterday. When it comes to, um, to communications, we really need to try and keep this message very simple for consumers. You know, we don't expect them to be experts in the types of polymers that, were, that are being placed on the market, um, which is one of the key reasons why we think this rationalising and design is really critically important, um, as well as the ability for people to put any types of plastic film in. And even in the industry, you know, sometimes you look at a film, you're feeling it and working, trying to work out what it is. And it's very difficult for us to work it out. So I don't think that we should be putting that on consumers we need to make, make sure that it's a very straightforward process for them. Um, next slide, please. So, um, so we actually did some testing quite recently to find out well, what is it that people are calling this stuff? We all call it film and flexibles. Quite sure that, um, that no one else does um, if you're talking to your friends and family and your children. So we did consumer testing. We had a very robust um, sample size for doing that. We tasted all sorts of names. Um, including film and flexibles, um, including things like scrunchy plastics, which is another term that sometimes you use, soft plastics. The absolute number one that came out of all of this is that people think that the, the term plastic bags and wrapping is a name that they understand. They, they know when we're talking about that, um, that it's, it's plastic film. So what, that's the terms that we all need to start getting behind and have a consistent message to consumers. The other thing that we found is that, um, is that actually if we are, when we're talking to people about it, using that description of plastic bags and wrapping coupled with the recycled now swoosh is also really, really important. So we're now in the process of, um, of, of developing some guidance, which we'll be providing particularly to supermarkets so they can use those in their collection points, um, but also local authorities um, so that you can help direct your residents um, to these collection points and of course, all the other stakeholders recoup and the great work that they do um, in their um, citizen campaigns as well. Next slide, please. So back to the roadmap, um, when it comes to sorting the processing in their markets, um, the key points I really wanted to pick up here is that um, the biggest market for film is food contact. We cannot ignore that fact and we cannot get um, all of this material back into food packaging without chemical recycling. We, we, we are going to need that. Um, and we have a group that's set up under the UK Plastics Pact to focus very specifically on that issue, um, looking at things like design, but also um, looking at how it is that we might need a protocol for actually assessing recyclability um, for these processes as well. But that's not to say that we're ignoring mechanical recycling. We need it. And from an environmental perspective, it's actually better. Um, it, it has a lower carbon impact to mechanically recycle. We need more end markets for um, outside of food packaging as well. And we have a group that's very focused um, on setting that up. Um, clearly, in order to, um, to, to really uh, ensure that we have the investment that's required, we need clarity from governments on the policy direction on the collection of film in order to stimulate that. Um, it's not going to happen without it, um, it, it, of the scale that we need in order to deliver the targets. However, we are also hearing some really positive developments. Um, it was great to hear um, uh, recently around JPLAS and um, the, the processing capacity that they've put in um, to accept household type films, so that's great news. And we're also administering a fund um, on behalf of government, a resource action fund, and we are looking forward to making some very positive announcements about increased capacity for plastic film um, for the householders on that as well. Um, next slide, please. So, what else do we need to be thinking about? So recycling is obviously very, very central given the quantity of it that we, that, that, um, that we use, um, but it isn't just about recycling. So, um, so we pr produced a report which we published last year. We're now in the process of um, reviewing that report. Sorry, there's a fly floating around my screen, it's very annoying. Um, we will be um, updating that report and, um, and publishing that in spring next year. Um, 
But when it comes to sort of these, these problematic areas that wrap what we believe is that we should be using as little of it as possible, but as much as necessary. And that doesn't mean just switching from one material to another. It looks at where we can actually achieve absolute reduction because all materials have an impact. Um, so an example is Tesco's and the move that they made um, to remove shrink wrap from, um, from tinned food, foods, for example. Um, we're also doing some research to look at um, where it is possible to remove plastic film, um, particularly from fruit and vegetables. And um, there's been quite a lot of research um, of looking at food waste in the supply chain, which is very welcome. We need more of that. We need more of the evidence to come through. Um, but we also now turning our attentions to what happens to, food, to, to that material in the home. So, for example, you might deliver um, additional shelf life if you package bananas in bags. Um, and, but actually, if people get that home and the first thing they do is remove that bag um, from the bananas, then you're obviously significantly, you know, perhaps it's not, it's not necessary after all. So we need to do more research. We need the evidence on that. The other thing I just wanted to touch on briefly is compostables. Now, compostables is clearly a, um, a challenging area. I've seen some, some, some questions come through about that in the chat, um, particularly in relation to the infrastructure. Um, so these issues, we do need to examine them, but we do believe that there is potentially a role for, um, for compostables, particularly where they can facilitate the collection of food waste. So it's something to bear in mind take a look at the report that's on the website. Um, and final slide, please. So what we can do, we don't have to wait for any of this. Um, everybody here today is actually able to take some action um, to improve the circularity of plastic film. So whether you are a packaging designer, um, a company who is producing packaging, you know, some of these questions around is it necessary to do it? How can we deliver the products um, without potentially needing any packaging whatsoever? So, you know, going back to the example of Tesco's, um, can we re redesign it to improve its recyclability? What can we all do to help increase the awareness and the use of the supermarket collection points that are already in existence today? And many of you may not be using these facilities yourselves. You can start doing that from today. Um, how is it that we can also communicate with citizens? What are the channels that all of us have um, can use? Um, and how can we maybe direct people forward through the Recycle Now website and the locator tool that's there um, so that people can find out where they can take their plastic film? So the supermarkets are busy giving us their data on these collection points and uh, people can tap in their postcode and it will, it will tell them if, they're, if their supermarket collects it labeling people have talked about already and this is really important not just labeling of the material that can be recycled but also the stuff that can't we need to improve the quality of the of the material that's being recycled and reduce contamination for local authorities um, the other thing is that we are increasingly needing um, the evidence and insights around what is actually happening um, through existing collections. So if you're listening and you're a local authority who is, who is collecting this material or a waste management company um, or a reprocessor who are handling some of the household material, talk to us. We really want to understand more about it so that we can share the lessons and the good practice. So really help us fill those knowledge gaps. And finally, what can you do to be the end market and help um, stimulate end market stability? And that's it from me. Okay, thank you very much, Helen. Um, yeah, it's very interesting and we've got loads of questions coming in. So I'm, I'm going to try and pick through a couple. Um, one of them I just wanted to pick up on was about the use of supermarkets and returning plastic film. Um, I think one of the questions also touched on this as well about um, in the current situations, a lot more of us now getting home delivery of our food and um, items. So we're not going to supermarkets anymore. So what, what is the answer? Should um, the home delivery vans be taking back the film perhaps? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Um, and I think that the online delivery from what we've heard from the supermarkets, we think that that is absolutely 
an increasing area and will continue to be a, um, an increasing trend. But a lot of people are still going to physically to supermarkets. Um, and let's be honest, it, I think that you wouldn't necessarily take the film every single time that you go. You might store it up for a while to, um, before going. Um, but in terms of online uh, delivery take back, yes, that is absolutely a possibility. We have looked into that. Um, but there are, you know, there are considerations. And of course, COVID is, um, is going to be central to any considerations around that. Okay, thank you. And a question here, I'll read it out um, to Helen. How should we define greenwashing? Is repurposing, i.e. making a park bench or a watering can, for example, part of the solution? To me, that is not circular economy, still linear, maybe slightly longer, but linear nonetheless, and therefore very much greenwashing. Any view on that? So I think our view on this is really any virgin replacement has got to be a good thing. If you were going to be using an oil based, um, you know, taking virgin material and using it for a product, then that is not as good for the environment as if you're using a recycled material. However, it's very much favourable that we try and keep the material as far up the chain as we possibly can. So achieving that packaging to packaging loop before it slips down into a drain pipe um, or a park bench and then um, never to be seen again. So we do need to keep the material as far up the hierarchy we can. And actually there are ways that we can do this through, um, through better design. So, um, so I'd suggest that, you know, particularly signposting to the recoup um, design guidance um, that is part of, that's on their website, as well as the CFLEX guidance. Okay, thank you very much. Like I said, loads of questions coming through. Um, just um, a note to the rest of the panellists, um, what I've realised is now with the questions and answers, if you want to actually type your answer into the person, you can do. So if you want to have a look at that, or you can press the button to answer live. So that's one way of dealing with um, a lot of the questions if, if people want to answer straight away today. So you can actually do that yourself as a panelist. Thank right, uh, thank you, Helen, for that presentation. Um, now, our next speaker is Tom Emans, President of Plastics Recyclers Europe. And Tom will be giving us a European perspective of the markets along with some of the challenges. Thank you, Tom. Good morning, everybody. Um, of course, I would like to go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm more than happy then to give me the opportunity to say something and more transparency on the flexible film in the European market. Um, I would like to take you with me yeah, to the highlights of this report that has been established together with Inomnia um, and will be updated every two years. This report has um, been formulated on the data from 2018 and incorporating 28 uh, European Union countries plus two. I would like to go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, you heard it this morning already. Plastic is in the center, I would say, of many debates yeah, in the society. We produce a lot and use a lot of flexible films daily. Yes, it protects our foods and our products, but the use of these flexible films often leads to pollution and leaks in the environment right at the end of the life. Yes, and as Stephen said before, insufficient fuel volumes of the flexible films are collected today. And the majority is still being landfill or incinerated. So we have to break the current chain. We have to be more responsible in how we handle flexible film packaging and to keep it as possible so long as possible in the loop. And it is only possible if we make flexible film circular, using the recyclates as much as possible and where possible, meaning in non-food applications. And I will give an insight in the current situation. I would like to say something about the challenge and opportunities, but be aware, we can only can achieve this mid and team effort, willing to face up to the challenge. Next slide, please. Flexible film represent the biggest share 
of the flexible, I'd say, or of the plastic uh, packaging applications. Flexible films are three times bigger than PET and maybe four to five times larger than rigid HGP or PP. The total amounts of flexible films consumption across all the polymers is estimated between a region of 30 to 50 million tons every year in Europe. 20% is polyethylene, made out of polypolyethylene, 12% is multilayers, 8% is other polymers, and the biggest part, approximately 60%, is made out of polyethylene. Next slide, please. Roughly 7 million tons of the polyethylene film is used for packaging application, of which 2 million tons is used for food packaging. As some of the maybe the most notable product trends, we can expect a likely increase in the demand of food packaging, while US carry bags will decrease due to the legislation pressure and of course the consumer preference. Next slide, please. Of the 50 million tons of flexible film that places on the market, currently only 46% of the flexible polyethylene film are collected for recycling. And then 1 million tons goes in export. And beside of that, there's a yield losses during the sorting process, resulting in that only 23% of the flexible film go to the flexible PE film recycle in Europe. Next slide, please. We know that an improving of the performance of the waste management and the collection and sorting infrastructure is an important part of progressing towards a world where no flexible plastic films end up in the environment. But this required new thinking, collaboration and financing. There is no harmonization in the collection and there's no standard extended producer responsibility schemes throughout Europe, as you can see on these pictures. There's no quality standards for the output of bales coming from sorting centers. The diversity of polymer films and the contamination that is in the flexible film waste streams make recycling of flexible film less efficient and create higher costs, less value, a lower quality of recyclates and a higher environmental burden. Next slide, please. Across Europe, we have approximately 170 plastic PE plastic film recyclers. When the total capacity input of 2.5 million tons, utilization of the plants is roughly 90%. If you look to the UK, we see a capacity of approximately 129 kilotons, which present 5% of the total installed capacity. Next slide, please. So of the 2.7 million tons of flexible plastic that's sent to the recyclers, they are able to make 1.8 million tons of recyclates, of which 0.5 million tons are made from film production waste. 39 recyclers, 23% of the total capacity, yeah, but more, has a more capacity than 20,000 tons. And they have more than 50% of the market share. The other 77% of the recyclers with less an output than 20,000 tons, they are struggling. They are not profitable so much as the big companies and the, for their investment, they are limited. They cannot invest in better recycling technology. They cannot increase their efficiency. They cannot reduce their current costs and they cannot make a higher quality. Please, next slide. So if you look to the output of the 1.8 million tons of the PE flexible film that come from the recyclers, only two thirds is suitable for film application. As the previous speaker said, we would like to go from product to product, making close loop. 500 to 600,000 tons go to an open loop, so as plastic pallets, park benches, or railway tires. There on the graphic, you can see the key outlets for recyclates in the non-food flexible PE film application. 
only 20% of the total demand come from recyclates. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So if you see today that only one third of the total volume of flexible plastic films placed on the market is collected for recycling, it is much too low. We, are, we have to collect more specialty from households. We can create, create a higher contribution to recycling targets. And of course, we must also improve the quality of sorting. We have to improve the capacity and efficiency by the recyclers. And we have to reuse the complexity of the flexible Phillips. Next slide, please. If we collect more, we need to think about recyclability. The flexible film needs to meet the conditions for recyclability. To improve the recyclability of flexible plastic films and therefore the quality of the recyclates, we have to start with the design of the films. For that reason, the industry should refer to a design uh, for recycling guidelines. We prefer Racy class, what is based on a long time experience and knowledge of the recyclers and developed and fine tuned by the value chain, focus on really circularity. Please, next slide. We have done an assessment and to see the recyclability. And for commercial and industrial plastic flexible films, the overall is good. And the main focus here is simply we should stop the export outside of Europe. For flexible films coming from household, simple, there's no harmonized extended producer responsibility collection scheme throughout Europe. Sorting should be done on polymer levels, hereby creating a separate stream for polypropylene. For multi-layers, there's no added value to go to a separate stream. They should or redesign going to a mono material. Maybe look to biodegradables. You should collect them separately to exclude them from the mainstream. But as we know, it is not everywhere available in Europe. For agriculture film, there's no European extended producer responsibility scheme. The material is still heavy polluted. And of course, it's still possible to recycle it but the cost of it is very high. And the application of this recyclate is very low due to the dark color of the material. For building and construction, we see the same situation as for agriculture film. The material is heavy polluted and make it unattractive to recycle this material. If we want to create really an added value, we need to establish a European-wide standard and harmonization for design, collection, sorting, and recycling. Next slide, please. please. Next slide, please. So, what is the main drivers, driver, main drivers for increasing plastic recycling? But in Europe, it is the legislation and the market itself. Simple, we would like to create a circular economy. We would like the reduction of plastic waste and avoiding plastic pollution, and that is the highest priority when we talk to politic makers, and which will be supported by a more stricter legislation, just as a landfill ban, higher demand on the extent of producer responsibility schemes, more specific recycling targets, and a mandatory recycling content is required. Next slide, please. Sir David Attenbrock created the movie The Blue Planet, which led to the worldwide recognition of the impact of plastic lead leakage into the environment and oceans. The Alan McCartney Foundation report that it could be more plastic than fish in the world oceans by 2050. Why is the concern from the consumers? The new plastic economy, the global commitment, and the different plastic packs that has been created and the leaders
and the leaders and the leaders of the consumer good com uh, co companies, industry, countries, region, as well as the politic makers, have committed themselves to commitments thanks for billions of euros. This to increase the use of recycled plastic and keep it in the economy and out of the environment. But as our report clearly show, we have to rise the level of ambitions and to match them with more action to accelerate the transition to a really circular economy for flexible plastic films. But be aware, simple substitution, plastic with alternatives, just as paper, glass and aluminium is not the way to go. All the alternatives use much more resources, more energy and will resulting in a higher greenhouse gas emission. The way is simple to go is keeping the flexible film in a loop and reduce the use of virgin plastics. Please, next slide. Despite in the fact that I'm a really plastic recycler, I prefer to prevent and to reuse first. And when we think about the end of life of a product, then design for recycling is necessary. We have to increase the separate collection of flexible plastic films. The quality of the waste can be improved by a better sorting at the households, at the source. The less the contaminated the stream, the better the quality of the recyclates. Plastic recycling are searching for the right and enough plastic waste. And for this reason, we have to invest in new resorting capacity. And it is viable that we have standards for sorting output bales in Europe. We have to sort by polymers and maybe be colors. The PPV film, flexible film, can be captured in a larger single stream and processed into a commodity bale so that this stream can divert from incineration. Multilayers is in contamination in the flexible plastic film streams. We have to redesign, redesign the multilayer flexible films to money material or to capture them directly by the sorting center so that this material goes not and not to the recycle and influence the efficiency and the quality of the recyclates. Next slide, please. Yes, if film recycling is to be successful, we need to invest in new technology. So we need to do hot wash, we need to do a de-inking, we need to do a better separation. We need to maybe measure the compositions. We need to use maybe additives. Then one thing is very important. Our customers want to have the same quality as that from Virgin. Next slide, please. So I would like to make it very clear. We need to increase recycling capacity in Europe to be able to achieve the recycling targets. If we want to be resource efficient, we need to push for recycling content in new products. There are three reasons for me to have a mandatory recycling content. The first is one, we need to create a necessity market for recyclates. Number two, companies have to realize that the today's products will become a required recycle input for the next generation products. And number three, lastly, recycling content will decoupling recycled plastic from oil and virgin. We as recyclers, we are aware that we have to collaborate and to share our whole knowledge with all the players in the value chain. We need to get need to more harmonization, standardization and certification for traceability and transparency. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So with our prospects of markets for recycled plastic and flexible plastic film, as we show here, and in our report, flexible plastic packaging has the highest potential to contributing 
to the European plastic recycling target, we could triple the uptake of recyclates in flexible plastic film in the next decade. Next slide, please. They all. I know it is very important that we take the right decision. And if we get all more criticism or comments. Instead, to make unpopular measures, which will not make the difference in the end. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, I definitely know which place I'd like to go on holiday to, and it's not the one on the left. So um, I've got quite a lot of questions still coming in. So um, a quick one, I hope, hopefully, is for Tom. Um, it's a technical one. It says, is recycling a flexible polyethylene packaging sensitive to the polymer type, for example, LDPE compared to HDPE, LDPE and NDPE? Is it okay with a PE film mix or, just, or do they have to be handled separately in current mechanical recycling? So quite a technical one there for you. Um, for, the, for the luck that I do in many years. <laughs> so we make no difference. Yeah. Yes, as this depends on what part of HGP and LD, LDP you will have. People know that you will change maybe the properties. Yeah. So the melt flow index will be influenced if you have more LD, LDP yeah, instead than you have maybe um, LD. So yes, you can mix them together, but then you will get different melt flow index in. If you have a high proportion of HGP, then you will maybe change your dart when you make a film out of it. Uh, but in general, you can recycle them together. Okay, thank you very much. Right, just looking at the time, we'll, we will move on and then we'll go back to questions um, after the final speaker, which is uh, Laszlo Zikli, who is the Vice President, Head of Plastics Applications from Tom Sorting Solutions. And Laszlo is going to tell us a bit about the sorting technology. Thank you very much, Laszlo. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yes, indeed, my, my presentation will be more technical, um, more from field. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, yes, I'm with Tomra since nine years and, and I'm heading the plastic uh, department or the plastic application department. And uh, before I jump to my uh, presentation, I would like to introduce um, actually our company because probably most of them don't know Tomra. I mean, um, we are a technology supplier, so it, it would make sense. Um, so Tomra was founded in the beginning of the 70s and uh, meanwhile we are a group which is uh, publicly listed in on the stock, uh, Oslo Stock Exchange and we have worldwide around 4,000 employees. And the company, the next slide, slide please. The company um, has actually two uh, main business areas. One of the business areas is the Tomra Collection Solution um, I'm talking about the um, uh, RVM, so the reverse vending machines uh, for the deposit system. Um, some of you know this, this system uh, when you buy a um, PET bottle, you pay a fee and when you bring it back to the, to the machine, you get your money back. So this is one part of the business and the second one is uh, Tomra Sorting Solutions. Um, and this sorting division is also split in three other streams which is food sorting, so really food, not food waste, food sorting, mining, and recycling. So uh, what do we actually do? We, we really develop, produce, and sell cutting edge sorting technologies for different uh, industries where automatic sorting and processing um, are essential. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, so we are using a wide range of optical uh, detection technologies like uh, near infrared technology, so NIR, visible light spectrometry, so VIS, uh, X-ray, laser, different kind of lasers, different kind of color cameras, RGB cameras, um, electromagnetic sensors, and so on and so on. So there are a lot of uh, technologies. And in some cases, the combination of this to identify um, different uh, material properties, such as material, material composition. So if it's HDP, LDP, PS, HIPS, and so on, uh, but also color of the objects, um, 
atomic density, electron, uh, electric conductivity, um, meanwhile also shape and so on. In order to, to sort uh, some of the post-consumer packaging, we are using different technologies because uh, then we can sort more exactly. For the detection uh, of the um, detection and sorting of the flexible um, and um, film plastics or course consumer packaging we are using mainly NIR and this technology and the, the units which um, which we use um, we call auto sort and respectively auto sort speed air the functionality or the functional principle is shown here so basically the input material is evenly distributed in other conveyor belt uh, which you can see uh, is actually an acceleration belt which runs up to four, meanwhile six meter per second, depending on the configuration of the sorting unit. Um, and then we have the detection bridge, the number two, um, so extremely fast and powerful NIR and these sensors are recording the specific infrared spectra of each every object on the belt, um, material and color, sometimes even shape or identified at the same time. The sorting unit can distinguish between different materials. So it's not just for plastic, it's also for paper, wood, textiles, rubber, and so on. Um, and at the end of the acceleration belt, we have a valve block with several hundreds of magnetic valves. Um, and these valves are controlled by the control uh, center, which is a computer and uh, Valves are ejecting the wanted or unwanted material. So depending if we are sorting something positive, that means we want to recover um, a specific material, or we we want to separate the impurities from a concentrated fraction. So this is basically the the um, working principle of the optical sorting unit. Of course, when we talk about recycling and the recycling of film and flexible but not just flexible also rigid um in a whole recycling trend is not just optical sorting so it's, it's a, uh, um, a group of the different technologies uh, which uh, play a important role in order to to achieve high high quality products next slide please um, yeah, for a high quality recycling process um, for film, but not only, also for, for rigid plastics, uh, these five steps are necessary. I'm concentrating at the moment on, on mechanical recycling, but I am aware that um, there is no silver bullet for this plastic issue. So we have also multi layers, and I'm quite convinced that um, the chemical recycling will complement uh, the mechanical recycling in the future. So it's important to work on design for recycling to keep the packaging as, as simple as possible, if it's, if, if it's possible. Um, but um, these, these two processes, the mechanical and chemical, will complement each other. Um, but in this case, I will concentrate on the mechanical recycling. So um, of course, these, these five steps are, are very important. The first one is collecting and recovering of the film from different waste streams. Um, also, the other speakers um, mentioned that um, at the moment, just a tiny part of the film is really recycled. Um, one issue is that the post-consumer waste is, or, or the, the collection of the waste in different countries it looks different. So the waste collection system is different. In, in some of the countries like Germany and, and especially Western Europe, we have a separate collection for post-consumer packaging. In other parts of Europe or in other parts of the world, we don't have. That means if we don't collect enough, we cannot sort enough and we cannot recycle enough. So this is one of the, the most important. The second step uh, is of course the pre-sorting of the film. Um, as soon as you collected the waste and you recovered the film, normally on the market is just uh, film concentration. So the bailed film, we know the, the fractions like DSD320 and the three, uh, DSD323 and so on. 
uh, but this is mainly um, yeah, a mixture of different kind of polymers like LDP, LLDP, HDPE, um, but also polypropylene film, laminated, multilayer, and so on. And this has to be sorted in different fractions. And normally in, in, the, uh, in the industry, they sort by material and in some cases also by, um, by color. That means they concentrate on, on clear, white, uh, and then the light, light colors and the dark colors. So if, you, if we want to go for high quality recycling, which means that we can keep the material as long as possible in the loop, we have to do these steps. Otherwise, it, the only way is the downcycling, which we want to avoid, of course. Then the third step, it's, it's the washing. Um, and uh, this is one of the most important steps. So, so we are not in, involved in the washing step. We are doing just the pre-sorting and the flake sorting. But this is one of the key, key steps in the whole process. Uh, and Ton mentioned already that um, it, is, it is really important that we have a hot washing step, um, which in the past, it was not really state of the art. So everybody was washing with a cold washing, even if cold washing means 40, 45 degrees, uh, we need higher temperatures to, to get the, the film clean. And then um, after the washing, of course, there, there is an important step, which is, we call it the flake sorting. That means the last impurities from the washed material, which could be different polymers, for example, polypropylene and polyethylene, um, but also different colors, if we sort by color, have to be removed. And for that uh, reason, we are re recommending a flake sorting. And of course, the last step is the extrusion and pro uh, um, extrusion step and production step, which um, is also important depending what kind of filtration you are using. <clears throat> sorry, sorry about it. So um, I know all these steps are not new, so it, it's, it's still, still uh, in the industry, but as you know, the devil is in the details. So you, you have to have the right sorting concept, the right equipment, not just the optical ones, also the, the mechanical ones, the right settings. But um, as I mentioned before, the optimization of the washing process is a key element. What kind of washing you are using, the temperature, if you're using 40 degrees or 70 degrees and so on. Percentage of the caustic soda uh, is important. Uh, we did a lot of tests with that um, together with partners who are producing washing lines um, and also time, of course. Time is, is, is crucial. And then how you, you clean the, the, the washed um, flakes um, and so on. So I don't want to go in details now um, because these are um, yeah, too detailed. Um, using the DSD3, 20 fraction, uh, I would like to illustrate these treatment steps. So next, please, next uh, slide, please. Yeah, uh, we did in the past several tests uh, with, with big companies. Uh, we are also part of the CFLEX uh, project. Um, we, we tested, or tested, it was not just testing, it's really a huge amount of, of foil sorted uh, to find out which quality are, are achievable. Uh, we took the DSD310 uh, fraction, which is quite known in Europe, and then we, we split it in different material and colors. In this case, I will show you the, the transparent one because this, is, this has a high demand on the market. Um, I think that it is important to have uh, a market for the recycled product, otherwise the recycling industry will not invest and will not uh, struggle to get a better quality. So this, this is a must in my opinion. So we took, uh, we were concentrating on the transparent one. We sorted out, we cleaned it. Then uh, we sent it to our um, partners uh, for washing step. So they, um, they did the hot washing. And uh, after the washing step, we, next slide please. We, um, we, we flake sorted the, um, yeah, we did the flake sorting on, on this, this material. 
um, even if it's a little bit harder uh, than uh, or challenging than, than rigid plastic, but it is a cleaning step, so it's not a sorting step. You still see in the hot washed fraction that you have some, some different colors, uh, mainly dark ones, which has to be removed in order to get a, a nice transparent one. Um, and then you can see on the right side, the end product, which is, this is still a, let's say a fluff, which we send it then to another company who extruded that and produced the recyclate. Next slide, please. So this was the end product, um, many, many kilos, many tons, which we produced. And then we sent to, to packaging producers, to foil um, film producers, to, to have the feedback from them because this is important. Don also mentioned that at the moment there is no standardization of the quality. So um, everybody compares the recycled material with virgin material. Um, and um, that doesn't mean if we consider the material good or perfect, all the companies will consider it. Fortunately, um, the feedback of the companies were, was really positive. So they are interested in this kind of material. The only issue is that at the moment, just a handful of companies are able to produce high quality film, LDP mainly, because this is LDP. And that's why we, we struggling or we want to convince the industry to, to show interest, to, to, to signalize to the um, recycling companies that they can use this material, they would use this material, and then uh, we will boost also the recycling industry. I'm aware that at the moment we have the issue with uh, polyolefins and food contact, which is at the moment not solved. So even if you have a top quality material, it's difficult to, to use it in food contact because the EFSA will not give you a positive opinion. We know also some companies that are using FDA, to, to, um, to bring it back in food contact. So this is still a topic which has to be discussed and we have to find a solution. So next slide, please. Yeah, that was the short presentation about, uh, let's say the technical part, uh, this is the recycling part. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Laszlo. Um, and just on the technical part, there has been some technical questions coming in, so I'll, I'll put them to you now while it's still fresh in your mind. Um, has there been any change in technology to detect PET slash PE laminates separately to PET to remove them from the PET stream? Also, PP slash PE laminates to remove them from the PP stream? Okay. So there are some technologies, but it's also has its limitations. So uh, depending uh, how thick the thickness of this, this layer, if we talk about, uh, let's say in some cases, three micron, then unfortunately not. So it's, it's, it's still not visible for the optical detection. This is the truth. That's why we, we try to convince also the brand owners and the packaging uh, producers to skip or try to, to skip the, the multi-material um, packaging and go for a multi-layer multi but mono-material, which in some cases uh, did work, especially so for pouches. Um, so we have to work together to find the solution. Okay. Also, also the optical sorting has its limitation. Yes, yeah, I understand, yeah. I mean, this definitely is a theme coming out about the design for recyclability, isn't it? About having uh, more straightforward materials to be able to recycle. Um, I've got another technical question. Is there truth behind the position that NIR sorters cannot distinguish black plastic trays from the conveyor belt? Or is the issue for black plastic trays more to do with the demand and recyclability? So that's, that's not really the black color of the issue. It's, it's how you get it black. And uh, very common in the industry to use carbon black um, for, for this product. Uh, and that's true, the NIR has its limitation. It, uh, it, it doesn't recognize um, carbon black glazed black items. That's why many companies are working uh, or, or developed already new, new uh, master batches which are not based on carbon black 
and these objects are detectable by NIR um, without issues. So, so there are some uh, products already on the market. Uh, we tested a lot of them in our test center. And um, also for a black object, black packaging, which is contains carbon black, there are some technologies. It's not NIR, it's middle infrared technology. But due to the fact that the amount is quite small on the mount, uh, market and it's getting lower and lower, of course, the industry is not really investing like we would like to. Okay, thank you. Uh, last one direct to you. Is it, is it possible to know what the container is made of fully covered by a shrink sleeve label and sorted accordingly? So I guess the question is if we have a full sleeve bottle, right? So is, it, is it possible to know what the container is made of if fully yeah. covered by a shrink sleeve label? It might be me reading it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, there is no yes or no. So depending on the material, uh, which kind of sleeve that is. Um, we tested this also with brand owners and packaging uh, producers. And if the, the thickness of the sleeve on the bottle it has a certain thickness, let's say smaller than, than 50, 40, 50 micron, then we get a signal and then we can detect the material below. If it's, let's say, it's a, um, a PET bottle with a, a PE sleeve on it, or it's a HDP bottle with a PP sleeve on it. So this is, um, this is possible, but there are so many factors which can have a negative impact on it. So the color of the, the sleeve, if you use whole carbon black, if it's laminated or not, uh, what kind of color um, um, paint you use. So we cannot say always it's de detectable, but uh, in the majorities. So we, we tested several hundreds of, of products and the majority is detectable. Yes. Okay, thank you. But of course it's more difficult to, to sort them uh, than, than a normal bottle without a full sleeve. Yeah, okay. Right, I'll, um, I'll, I'll start on some more general questions. So thank you all, all the speakers for that. So um, if, you, if you want to answer it, please let me know. Um, so we'll start with um, one about deposit return schemes. Would a, wouldn't a DRS adapted for flexibles play a significant role in gaining more and better quality material for recycling? There are new DRS technologies that enable this. So what do the panel think of uh, deposit return for flexibles? Yeah, we get this question um, quite often, not just the flexible for other, other products, not just the PET bottles. And there are always some, some pros and contrasts. Um, we have to take into consideration that the deposit system at the moment, it's, it's just in a 12, 13 countries in the world. So um, that would not, push the industry or the recovery rate and recycling rate like we would like to. So I, I would concentrate more on the recovery of the film from, from uh, curbside than, um, than implement deposit systems for, for banks, for example. Okay, so Helen, I'm new to you. Uh, in here, Helen. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with Laszlo on that. And, and, and obviously the government are consulting on deposit return schemes at the moment. And I think we're very much we need to work find out what happens as a result of those consultations and then as and when it's implemented I think we probably need to walk before we can run with DRS. It cannot be the, the only the only solution the deposit for everything so I mean there are better solutions even if we are selling and producing this kind of machines but uh, it has to be realistic. Okay. In some, some uh, parts of the world probably would make sense. We, we, we have this discussion also in India because they have these this milk pouches um, or, or other packaging, but um, it's still a discussion. So it's, it's not been written in stone. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll move on to the questions. Are there any other comments? Tom, did you want to say anything? Or? I would like, yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Return deposit systems. I think that they're all right now what I mentioned, but if that is the only way, why not? But what is important here, we need to give the plastic a value, the plastic waste a value. And if it is maybe made in return deposit system, if that is only what will work, then let's do it. 
Then, so I will get, try to get a better, a higher push from everybody to simple, to collect, yeah, and to sort more and to recycle more. Um, ju just a comment to that. Um, I mean, we see worldwide that the PET bottles mainly have a value. So everybody knows that PET bottles have a value, independent in countries if you have the deposit system or not. They're not really fine PET bottles on the beaches because they are collected. Um, if we would give the same value to PE film or film in general, independent of PE film, PP film, and so on, uh, PS, HDP, uh, rigid, PP rigid, and so on, probably you will not find it on the beaches on, or not on the water, in the water. But they have to have a value on the market. So that is what we need to do. We have to create a value that it makes sense that people will collect it. Mm. Sachets making out of multi layers has no value. Nobody will collect them, so they will never be recycled and they will leak at the end or they'll end up in the oceans. Okay, thank you for that. Right, I'll ask another question. Do you think one day it'll be possible to get back to food quality through mechanical recovery? So, this is food quality plastic packaging through mechanical recovery. Tom? We already do that for PET and we can do it for HGP and PP when we talk about rigids. By film, I have my doubts. With the current technology, we cannot do it. But we don't know what will happen in the future. Yeah, maybe we will find some of innovation. I don't know. Okay. Laszlo, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, that's, that's the same what, what Tom, uh, uh, Tom said. Um, basically, in some countries it's possible. In Europe, it's more difficult because we have this regulation with EFSA, um, but there are some, some companies worldwide who are using also polyolefins in, in uh, uh, food applications um, without issues. Um, film, yeah, it will take some time. Okay. I do think though that there are some interesting emerging technologies, um, like for example, the Holy Grail project, which was initiated under the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is looking at digital watermarking. You can see Tom and Laszlo smiling. I'm not sure why, but uh, I don't know if they want to add any comment on it. And, you know, that clearly these technologies are pretty much early days. And there's other types of technologies, uh, next tech, next tech um, for example. Um, but I think, again, you know, we need to, to really understand how these could potentially work commercially at scale in rigids um, is, you know, I think is definitely the first step. So I would say Let's never say never, but I, I'm in agreement that it's, it's, it's going to be very challenging from a commercial perspective. And I agree with Helen that uh, there are some really interesting technologies in development, but it was going to take some time and to get back to food grade uh, will, be, um, will be a big challenge for films. Um, I think there, there could be, um, say, an easy opportunity to get back to non-food packaging in films potentially, and you can see some of those opportunities coming uh, through the presentations today. So um, we keep looking at those opportunities and looking at how we can support that development. But uh, today, that's a real challenge. To be honest, uh, to, to find out if it's possible or not, we have to take a look also to the chemical structure of the polyolefins. Um, so uh, there is a mi migration between polyolefins and products. This is uh, nothing new. We have to ex um, also, also know what the EFSA expectations are in order to get a positive opinion from that. Um, the Holy Grail project, it helps or could help definitely, but would not uh, solve the problem completely. And um, we, we have to concentrate also on the non-food applications. So there are so many non-food applications out there where res recycled material could be used but the, in many cases they don't because they expect food grade. So to this, this is what I would expect from, from, from companies that they will check also their portfolio, where do they really need food grade, where not, and try to use high amounts of recycling. Okay, thank you. Um, I've seen a couple of questions about compostables, so I think I might touch on that next. Um, one of these is that at the moment compostable packaging is not accepted in food waste by all local authorities and it's very difficult to ensure that they are compostable 
and that collection crews um, can't read each pack to check whether it is or not. And so what are the panel's thoughts on compostables, please? Perhaps I can start. Um, so yeah, I mentioned compostables in my presentations and we are kind of investigating and looking at compostables, but we're focused on ensuring our packaging is recyclable as our main ambition within that area. And certainly within the UK, we need to be considerate to what the infrastructure has in place. And you're absolutely right for, from a point of view of compostable and biodegradable materials today. Um, it's not ideal from a point of view of the food waste collections. And it does uh, bring challenges in terms of that opportunity to check and determine that those materials that are being placed on the market are suitable for the processes that they, they may go, go on to go into. Um, so it's an infrastructure question for us um, from a UK perspective and something that um, I guess we'll need waste management companies to engage more on if uh, they would potentially accept packaging in the future. But at this point, we would accept that the infrastructure is not there and, and focus on ensuring our packaging is recyclable. Okay, thank you. Helen? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Alison, um, I think, and all the points that, that, that you've raised there. And um, I, mean, I think the citizens from, re from all of the research that we've done, and I know a lot of the brands have done this too, is, you know, people think that, that compostables are going to be the silver bullet solution. And of course, we know that that's just not going to be the case. Um, in terms of where the type, the, you know, what they make up, um, so the plastics packed represents 95% of the supermarkets um, and all, a vast majority of the brands that are sold through them. Um, compostables represent less than 0.1% of, of all the material that, that is sold. So they've got, they get quite a disproportionate sort of perhaps focus in a way, um, I think because of this, this um, consider people's belief that they could be the silver bullet. But, you know, I think that there are some areas where they could be used. Um, so, um, so closed loop facilities would be a really good example where you can, you know, which could also help to facilitate the collection of food waste. Lots of local authorities use them as um, food caddy liners. Um, and while the direction of travel is towards AD um, and in an AD process, all packaging is stripped out. Um, yeah, we do, you know, we do have to recognize as well that there are quality issues for the organic sector. Um, plastic contamination is a massive issue, um, both through um, IVC, open air windrow and AD, um, and that depackaging is not 100% effective. So I don't think we can shy away from that issue either. Um, and it's something that the Environment Agency are um, looking at very closely, and um, particularly in, in relation to the amount of actual plastic that, that should be entering um, organics reprocessing facilities. But labelling and the message to consumers is really difficult because of these infrastructure challenges. Um, in the guidance that I refer referenced, um, I'd, I'd urge everyone to go and have a look at it. We've actually got some, um, some example messages that could be used for consumers based on the existing infrastructure today. And the issue is that this kind of bags or, or products can send the wrong signal. That, uh, that the consumer thinks, okay, I can and throw it away just, just everywhere because it will disappear in two weeks, which is not the case. Um, we have this also in, uh, in the, the waste, uh, bio-waste collection. Uh, and I, I was in the past responsible for bio-waste treatment. And uh, this, this um, causes a huge issue in the composting plants. So producing biogas, producing composting, um, and um, this, these companies don't want to have it because in such a short time, it's not composted. So you will still have it in your product, which is a huge issue. That's why we have to be careful where we use it and, and which signal we send to the customers. Okay, thank you. Um, just to finish with a quick one, a um, bit, bit different. What do you think about edible bioplastics? So you don't need recycling. It's, if it's not there to be eaten, but safe to discard in nature, protein-based, for example, um, it can be monolayered with additives in regards to applications. So get, get rid of the compostables and let's just have edi edible plastics. What do you think about that? 
well, from what I've seen, I think there are some interesting developments um, in those technologies, but there are also a lot of constraints, um, particularly in with regards to how quickly you need to consume them. So we've seen them used in marathons, for example, um, where they're produced on one day and then they're consumed on the next day. Um, so perhaps there's a role for them where, where, you, can, where you can have that quick consumption. Um, I don't think it's going to be the silver bullet though. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. So um, we've finished with the questions and answers uh, session time. Um, as I said at the beginning, all the questions will either be answered um, through the, the portal or Recoup will gather them and then send them out to the participants at the end of the session. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to all our speakers for a very interesting and informative session and also a big thank you to our audience for joining us today. Um, Steve did mention there will be a copy of the webinar and slides sent um, to all attendees. And again, another plug for the rest of the Recoup webinars. This is a series of six, is that right, Steve? Six uh, webinars that you're doing. This is the second one. Yeah, this so, is the second one. It's the six in total, but you get all the details from just going to the website. So they're, they're, um, they're spit across the next uh, four to six weeks, I think. So um, just have a look and see what uh, other ones take your interest. Okay, so yeah, please do go to the website and have a look. Um, I just, again, I'd like to say a big thank you for everybody. It's been really interesting and a lot of uh, common themes, I think, there on design for recyclability and messaging and uh, labelling of products as well. So I think um, we, we shall wait and see what the next round of consultations brings us next year, but hopefully we, we, we do sound like we're all singing off the same hymn sheet to begin with, so that's good to hear. So thank you everybody and I presume this is like all the other webinars, it will end rather abruptly. So I'll just say goodbye to everyone now as well the panellists and thank you. Thank you, thank you Carol, thank you everybody. Thank you everybody. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Bye bye.